is a good medicine. Uh, Koenig writes, do religious beliefs really keep one mentally and, health and physically healthier and reduce the uh, mortality as some claim? If so, uh, this finding has major implications for our struggling healthcare system. Koenig and colleagues clearly believe that medicine can be transformed by introducing religious practices into clinical medicine. And the way in which, uh, one of the ways in which they propose to do that is to conduct what I described before, which is the spiritual history. Uh, the spirit, here, here are the questions, uh, some of the questions from one variant. Do you consider yourself religious or spiritual? How important are these beliefs to you? Do you belong to a spiritual community? How might healthcare providers address any needs in this area? Others ask, what can I as a physician do to support your religious commitment? A question that strikes me as rather odd. So, uh, Christina Puhalski, who was one of the proponents of a spiritual history, estimates that it takes about four or five minutes. Four or five minutes doesn't seem so long until you consider that the average physician appointment is 19 minutes, according to the most recent evidence. So assuming that that's a correct figure, a spiritual history is going to take more than 20% of that time. So you have to ask yourself, what will the physician not discuss in those four minutes that are dedicated to a spiritual inquiry? Um, that becomes important because there have been recent reports about how easily or how well physicians comply to evidence-based guidelines, for example, for prevention or treatment of chronic disease. To, to refer simply to one report recently published in the American Journal of Public Health, if physicians were to follow all of the guidelines established by the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force, which uh, issues evidence-based guidelines on what constitutes good preventive medicine, they would spend 9.7 hours every day. That's just for prevention. That has nothing to do with treating chronically ill patients. And so you have to ask yourself, what will physicians not be able to do if they're engaged in spiritual inquiries with their patients? There's another interesting element, though, of the spiritual history that I think that has flown below the radar, and I think it's important to, to uh, at least examine. In a case report published in JAMA in, the, in 2002, Koenig uh, uh, identifies an elderly woman who copes with her chronic pain by religious ritual. You can ask the question, why can't the chronic pain be treated successfully? But forgetting about that, she copes with it successfully by religious ritual. And Koenig says, keep it up. Now, that seems like a, reasonably, uh, a reasonable comment by Koenig for a successful strategy. But it occurs to me that he says keep it up not only because it's successful, but also because he agrees with this as a strategy. So I've decided it would be interesting to play with this example and consider variants of it to see whether Koenig would in fact endorse them. So would, a young, would Koenig say the same thing to a young woman with Crohn's disease who copes with it by gossiping with her friends? Would he say keep it up? Would he say the same thing to a young man who copes with crippling rheumatoid arthritis by watching pornographic videos. And would he say, no pun intended, keep it up? <laughs> would he say to a middle-aged man undergoing chemotherapy who copes with it by attending Aryan Nations meetings, would he say, keep it up? Now, the, the issue is, if, if the reason why Koenig is saying keep it up to the woman who copes with religious uh, uh, ritual, because he approves it, does he therefore have to approve these successful, although socially questionable, strategies that these patients identify? Do we really want physicians to be engaged in, in making judgments, of value judgments, about our behaviors uh, in, in the way that this examination suggests? I think probably not. Uh, physicians should be involved in helping us to solve medical matters and not becoming arbiters of uh, of values in our lives. There are some other practical questions, uh, ethical questions that arise in, the, in connection with attempts to bring religious practices into medicine. And the three that we've identified are manipulation and coercion, uh, privacy, and uh, causing harm. Uh, let me talk about uh, those very briefly. Uh, in uh, February of 2004, CBS News pub, uh, ran a program on a Colorado orthopedic surgeon who prays with his patients. 
When does he pray with his patients? Does he pray with them when they come to his office to make a decision to proceed with surgery? No. Does he pray with them when they come to the hospital for routine pre-surgical testing? No. Does he pray with them when they arrive at the hospital on the day of surgery? No. He prays with them when they are gowned and supine on the gurney, ready to go into the operating room, and then he stands over them and says, mind if we say a prayer? He practically has a scalpel to their throat. And he says, mind if we say a prayer? Even, I don't even know if Richard Dawkins <laughs> would resist, would be able to resist that. <laughs> But we can ask. It's an outrageous manipulation of a vulnerable uh, patient who may be in pain and is undoubtedly fearful. That's an outrageous case of manipulation. So manipulation is one, one issue. Privacy is another. There are many factors in our lives that we can identify as associated with health outcomes that we nonetheless feel are out of bounds for religion. And the best example is marital status. There's abundant evidence being married is good for your health. You, uh, evidence suggests that you live longer. The cynics in the audience may say it only seems like you live longer. But, <laughs> but we don't expect physicians to say to a patient, Bob, you're a single man, 36. I see that you're not married. And all this evidence suggests that being married is good for you. So I think in the next year, let's make a plan for you to get married. That would be the last time you'd ever see that physician. And it's because, not because we dispute the link, but we, because we regard marital status out of bounds for medicine. For many people, religious practices are equally personal and private. And the third, is, uh, the third ethical concern is actually causing harm. When I started in this field, I was interviewing young women who were awaiting the results of gynecologic biopsies in order to determine whether they had cervical cancer. And I was, while I was interviewing my patient in, in uh, one bed in a semi-private room, uh, the other patient who was separated uh, from my patient only by the usual thin curtain uh, was awaiting her biopsy results. And she was there with her parents and, and, uh, I, and some other relatives. And while I was conducting the interview, the biopsy results for the other woman came back. And they were negative. And her father exclaimed to no one in particular, we're good people. We deserve this. Now, that's a perfectly reasonable thing to, for the father of a potentially gravely ill young woman to say. Perfectly reasonable. But what was the young woman I was, investing, uh, I was interviewing supposed to say to herself when her biopsy came back positive? Was she supposed to say, I'm a bad person. That's why I got cervical cancer. I've been insufficiently faithful. That's why I got cervical cancer. It's bad enough to be sick. It's worse still to be gravely ill. But to add to that the burden of failure or remorse over some kind of failure of devotion is simply unconscionable. But that's what you get when you make claims or even imply that there are health benefits to religious devotion. You automatically suggest that people who fail to recover or who, who uh, contract an illness may have done so because of some religious failure. And so there's significant uh, ethical problems as well. The, the final, uh, so it, it's, it's not good science and it's not good medicine. I don't even think it's good religion. And the best evidence is in today's times. This is the, uh, the report of the, the imaging studies of people who were speaking in tongues. Researchers at the University of Pennsylvania took uh, brain images of five women while they spoke in tongues and found that their frontal lobes, uh, the thinking willful parts of the brain through which people control what they do, were relatively quiet, as were the language centers, the regions involving uh, uh, that maintain self-consciousness were active. So a few weeks ago, there was another paper published in, in which a similar imaging study was done with, um, uh, I, I believe it was done with nuns who were engaged in ritualistic prayer. And I got a call from Nature inter asking me to comment on this. And my first comment was, so what? Let's investigate what happens in my brains when I'm eating cheese. Something's going to happen. What's the big deal? The big deal here is that these researchers and, and many of the others think that they're going to support religion by submitting it to the tests of science and then determining that, the, that science can validate the tenets of religion. That's why many of the studies that have been conducted, that's the motivation behind many of the studies that have been conducted. And it seems to me 
that there is a real danger of trivializing the religious experience. There was a paper published in the American Journal of Psychiatry three years ago in which the sense of transcendence, uh, an index which was measured using a paper and pencil questionnaire, was shown to be related to dysregulated, to the dysregulation of the serotonin system in the brain. And the, the pattern of dysregulation was identical to the pattern seen in panic disorder. Now, do we really want people who are devoutly religious to think that all there is to their religious experience is the coursing of neurochemicals throughout the brain? Because if so, we can turn it on and turn it off with drugs. We can administer electrical stimuli to turn it up and turn it down. Is that really all there is? Should people who are devoutly religious be satisfied with that? I think the answer is probably no, and I think most people would regard it as even, even atheists, I think, would recognize that that is demeaning to, to the religious experience of, of people of faith. And so is it good science? No. Is it good medicine? No. It's not even good religion. Again, nobody disputes that religion brings comfort to people in times of difficulty, whether it's related to illness or otherwise. We shouldn't dispute that, but what we should question is whether medicine has anything to add to that. And I think to that, the answer is clearly no. Thanks. I'll just take a